I mean, breaking the rules is really fun. I mean, that's why I've, I've kept with it. I love breaking the paradigm and making it work. And it's been successful because of that. I, I've given talks at commencements, at universities, and the first thing I tell these kids, I said, look, life is a lot easier if you break the rules than trying to conform. Mm -hmm. Way easier. And probably a lot of you have been forced to study something that you have really no interest in doing. And in fact, you're going to get out of school and you're not going to work at what you studied. You know, maybe you studied anthropology. Well, good luck finding a job. I said, I saw a guy, Golden Gate Park recently. He's a dog walker. He's on his skateboard. He has 10 dogs <laughs> from little tiny Pekingese to German Shepherds, all on these Eskimo traces, sl Eskimo sled traces. And they're pulling like crazy and they're having the time of their life and he's just sitting there on a skateboard Mr. Cool, making $25 a dog an hour. Wow. So $250 an hour, and you're going to end up staring at a goddamn computer all day long. Mm. Which one would you rather do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Yvonne Chouinard. I'm Jamie Brissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More of a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Outdoorsman, self-taught blacksmith, and Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard never wanted to be a businessman. Rather, it was from his desire to innovate, to change the status quo, and to protect the environment that Patagonia was born. His recent decision to transfer all of Patagonia's voting stock to the Patagonia Purpose Trust and all of the company's excess profits to the Holdfast Collective, a nonprofit devoted to addressing climate change, sets a precedent for a new form of capitalism in America, one that considers quality and social impact over excess and consumption. All this is to say is Yvonne Chouinard is my kind of guy. We spoke in the front yard of his home, in Ventura, California. His front yard is in fact beachfront. There were sparkling waves in front of us. We considered surfing, but we wanted to get down to the business of doing this podcast. Ivan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I thought a good place to start would be um, the big announcement recently of giving the company over to the Holdfast Collective, <laughs> which <laughs> the, the New York Times called it uh, one of the biggest moves yet in climate philanthropy. Well, you know, uh it is for the U.S. I mean, a lot of this is, goes on in Europe. You know, the Rolex is a family-run foundation. Um, Bosch Siemens, Zeiss, you know, Zeiss lenses, Leica. Yep. They're all family foundations, and they work basically as a nonprofit, and they do various things with their monies. Uh, but it's very unusual in the States. We may be the first ones to actually do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just a logical step for us because I, I couldn't care less about being a businessman and I never wanted to be a businessman. And so, um, you know, I always felt like I could just walk away from it any time. Like my first business, which was making climbing gear at a machine shop and, you know, I was a blacksmith and made the world's best climbing gear. And when I sold it to the employees, I walked away and never looked back. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just, everybody thought, well, that, this is your baby. How can you step away from it? Like, no, oh, are you kidding me? I couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. And so nothing's changed in my life. I'm still, I'm still working. I'll probably die in the saddle. And I'm, I get a salary. And, you know, I, I eat the same thing for breakfast. Nothing's changed, really. It's just that it's a different form of capitalism where instead of the few top people in a corporation making all the money and then the rest are working stiffs, this is more egalitarian. Mm -hmm. And most of the profits, all the excess profits are going to go to saving the planet. 
That's the difference. Yep. And what, uh, I mean, it's an obvious answer, but I'd, I'll ask it anyway. What, what inspired you to do this? There, there's different ways you can step out of a company. I mean, you can sell it off. You can go public. You can, you know, bring in investors. You can have an employee-owned company. You can give it to your kids. My kids didn't want the company. They don't want to be billionaires. They're just like me. They're, they lead a simple life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then also, if you give it to your family, they're bogged down in estate taxes. And it takes, you know, probably cripple the company paying those taxes. Right. And so if I went public, then I'd lose all control over the company and I'd become part of the problem rather than the solution. We'd become profit driven instead of purpose driven. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, sec the secret of my company has been breaking the rules and making it work. Yeah. And if you're a public company, you can't do that because it's not your company anymore. So, and if, if it, I turned it into an employee owned company, then most employees are incapable of running their own company. That's why they're working for somebody else. And so then it becomes a very conservative company, unwilling to take risk. And I couldn't see a way out. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I heard about this idea and I said, well, let's give it a shot. And it's perfect, it's a perfect solution for me. Money's never been the motivation for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never taken hardly any money out of the company. We've, we, you know, we're, we're debt free. Mm -hmm. We don't have to deal with banks or anything. I've always put the money back into the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I don't even own this house. I sold this house. I, I pay rent here now. Okay. I sold it last year and I gave all the money to um, to this park that we're establishing in Patagonia, mm -hmm. Chile. Uh -huh. And uh, so yeah, I'm trying to simplify my life as much as I can. I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I own beater cars and that's the way it is. It's incredible. You to to succeed at or to have a company succeed at the level that Patagonia has, and for you to, you know, make your priority, being in the outdoors and kind of preserving yourself from a lot of the what would normally happen to someone that runs a company to, at the scale of uh, Patagonia. How how have you managed to do that? I mean, it's such a they're almost like two conflicting, uh, you know, um, intentions. Well, I. I'm kind of a craftsman, you know, I like working with my hands and I'm pretty good at it. And so when I was making mountain climbing equipment, I was, I mean, I've been lucky in being in the golden age of all of these different sports, whether it's spear fishing and, and uh, whitewater kayaking, surfing, climbing, all of this stuff. And so, when I was doing climbing, I was on the cutting edge of climbing in Yosemite and stuff, big wall climbing. And, and it's the most exciting time in any sport is when you're developing new techniques, mm -hmm. new equipment, and, you know, you're progressing like crazy. And so I just happened to be part of that. And I, I was good at inventing, not, not inventing, I'm not an inventor, I'm a innovator mm -hmm. I look at I look at a spoon and I say Jesus this thing you know doesn't fit your mouth you put it you put soup in there and it dribbles down your chin I mean I look at everything and I say I can make that better mm -hmm. and so that's what I did with climbing gear right with and you taught yourself blacksmithing correct I, yeah I, I'm self-taught and everything I mean I yeah like I play tennis I've been playing tennis for most of my life. I'm totally self-taught. You know, I've never taken tennis lessons. And mm -hmm. I learn everything on my own, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the, um, 
the climb, the sort of ethos of the climbing gear translated very neatly into the clothing. And I, I, I know, um, let my people go surfing. You talk a, a lot about, or you write a lot about, um, you know, just the quality, endurance, durability, etc. These these sort of tenets that are the underpinnings of both the clothing, but it seems like it was there with the with the with the pitons, etc. I I think we were the first ones to apply the principles of industrial design to making clothing. Like, okay, so we're going to make a bikini, okay? Well, you think, well, that's not a technical product. Well, our customers are out there body surfing with them. They're board surfing with them. The top falls down. You know, it's pretty embarrassing. So then you say, okay, so how can we solve that? Functionally. Mm -hmm. Everything starts with the function. And so the top's got to stay on. So we develop a fabric that is clingy and won't slip off. And whether it's a pair of socks or anything, it's, it's a technical challenge. Mm -hmm. And we apply all the principles of industrial design to solving them. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's our emphasis on quality is one of the reasons why we're successful. You know, our mission statement used to be make the best quality product. And we're dead serious about that. Mm -hmm. And we have, but then we had to say, well, what makes a quality piece of clothing? And uh, so we had to write down what all the different criteria are. Like right here, I got this pair of pants. These are 20 years old. And the pocket is blown out. Mm -hmm. The whole rest of the pant is perfectly good. Well, one of our criteria is that every part of the plant of the pant should wear equally yeah so that the whole thing suddenly is crapped out mm -hmm. well the pocket is crapped out way before the rest of the pants so it this fails our criteria mm -hmm. one of our criteria mm -hmm. the other criteria is uh we include social and an environmental responsibility so if you're going to say, which is the best electric car, you'd probably say a Tesla, right? But it totally fails social and environmental responsibility. Completely fails. But, you know, we're, we're so focused on our new mission statement is we're in business to save the whole planet. Yeah. So that is really an important part of our quality criteria. And, I mean, you could, you could be making a product that's the best of its kind in the world. From one to 10, it's a 10. And you give your people great benefits and you're noted for you know being a great employer, blah, blah, blah. You're making landmines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's no right way to make a landmine, mm -hmm. right? And so the secret of our success is including the social and environmental responsibility with our absolute focus on quality, mm -hmm. at how we define it. Yep. Has Patagonia felt like an extension of yourself in the sense of as you've progressed from a young climber to making the gear for climbing and then, and then evolving into making clothing? Yeah. Um, has it just felt sort of like an extension of the things that you're paying attention to and care about? You know, I, I mean, I've been all over the world climbing. I've climbed in every continent, including Antarctica. And, you know, I've surfed a lot of different places around the world. So I've, I've gone to Africa multiple times. And everywhere I visit a place where I haven't been in 10 years, I've seen deterioration in people's lives and deterioration in the environment. And so that's been my education. I mean, I, you know, I got a degree in auto mechanics from John Burroughs High School. That's it. And, uh, but my education has been traveling and seeing the world. Mm -hmm. And so I've always, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. I have a, I think a spiritual connection to nature. Yeah. And I think actually we're not gonna get anywhere in saving this planet until we get that connection. And as you know, this planet is not here to support us. Yeah. We're part of it. Yeah. We destroy 
the large animals first and guess what we're a large mammal so what I learned being a climber and surfer and stuff like that I've I created a company with those values mm -hmm. it's interesting because those values are almost I mean I'm not a climber but I'm a surfer and I and there's a there's a sort of a line across the wave. There's a way of surfing that has integrity, that's classic, timeless, etc. You know, it stands the test of time and there and there's and then there's more faddish ways of riding a wave. But I think in some way, um, being in the ocean, being a surfer, you know, there's that thing of like we are inherently environmentally conscious because after a rain we we see how the water changes. Or when a Doritos bag washes up on us while we're waiting for a wave, we realize how disgusting this is. But it's, I think we, we're at close proximity in a way that a lot of people in maybe urban environments are not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you protect what you love. If you're a surfer, I mean, you love the clean ocean and, uh, and, and, you know. I mean, look at the last few years. There's been no waves. Have you noticed that? I haven't, no. No west wells. I mean, a lot of northwest wells, and they just go, you know, where we live here, they just go right by Point Conception, you know. Mm -hmm. It's been months at a time with no swells. What do you think that is? I, th I think the whole climate has changed. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's not climate change. It's not global warming now. It's climate chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we never know what's coming next right we now. We don't know what's coming next. No, <laughs> absolutely. Jeez. Um, so you were in Maine for your early years, then you moved to Burbank, and then you started surfing and climbing kind of, I think, the north end of the valley. There are some rocks that you would climb. Yeah, out in Chatsworth. Yep. Yeah, I... I Used to go out there and climb, and uh, often I'd uh, take my surfboard and I'd surf Malibu, and and then you know Boulder and climb in Chatsworth on the way home, and um, all in one day. It's it was a yeah it was the same period that everybody was discovering surfing in California, you know, in the early fifties. Did it feel particularly sort of on the fringe or countercultural? Did it feel like it was this lifestyle that was a, you know, a different oh, pursuit? Yeah, absolutely countercultural. I mean, that's the that's the best part of it. Yeah, you I, know, when I when I was a kid, I could I could uh, pitch baseball really well. I could do a lot of these athletic things <clears throat> in team sports. When it came time. To do a game, I'd clutch up mm -hmm. people watching. Mm -hmm. And I realized a long time ago that I'm not interested in team sports. I'm not interested in playing someone else's game because they're going to win. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if uh, and and so I I played my own game. I was down in the LA River digging frogs and catching crawdads and and totally counterculture. And I've kept that all my life. I, mm -hmm. I uh, you know, I don't hang out with other businessmen. I don't, I don't uh, have that lifestyle of, of a big shot. Yeah. No, I love in, uh, in your book, you talk about, um, you compare admitting that you're a bu businessman to admitting an alcoholic in an <laughs> AA meeting. I love that. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, the, you're a reluctant businessman and a, and a hugely successful businessman. Has that... I mean, that's such an interesting thing because typically to succeed at the level that you have, there is this drive and determination. I mean, it's, it often comes from an Ivy League school and you can almost track in that person an early <laughs> determination, right, from, the, the, from childhood. But you're, you seem like that, that hasn't been the thing. No, it's, it's, it's kind of like climbing Everest where you focus so much on, this, on the, uh, getting to the summit that you compromise all the way. Mm -hmm. I... I didn't, if you ask me how much money we made last year, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. It's just, they told me once and I've forgotten it immediately. Uh -huh. it's, it's not the purpose. The purpose is the process. And if I see that the process is going well, I'm, I'm fine. And I never wanted to have people tell me what to do. And I don't like to tell other people what to do. So I'm not a micromanager. Mm -hmm. I just hire the best people and make sure that they're well trained, especially in the culture. Mm -hmm. Then I leave them alone. Yeah. And um, you know the quickest way to to go out of business is to delegate to the wrong people. So we make sure that we have the right people, 
and they come to work for us for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. They want to work under that mission statement of saving the planet. Yep. And so I just leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to, all my life, I've been able to take, you know, 1968, I took a six-month trip down to driving from Ventura down to the tip of South America and climbing and skiing and surfing all the way down. We skied all these breaks in Latin America that no one's ever heard of. And, hmm. um, it was a fantastic trip. Six months. Yeah. And the company didn't fall apart. Yep. That's what our, uh, you know, let my people go surfing is that, you know, when the surf comes up, you go surfing. You yeah. don't go next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Or if there's a powder dump and you're in the mountains, you go when there's powder, not when you have a day off. Yes. And so, you know, treat people with respect in that sense. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that because that I still I still struggle with that concept when I have a busy day of work and the surf's up and that I, I, I having surfed my entire life, I still struggle with the idea of I, I got to get it while I can and sort of shift my plans around. Yeah, you can set your life up like that because I did it. Yeah. And I, I'm convinced people do what they want to do. Yeah. They really do. When you think about your career, what are you most proud of? You know, to, to get back to the secret of our success, which is this focus on quality. Mm -hmm. Imagine if, you know, we, we got to get rid of fossil fuels, right? Nobody knows where to start. Where do you start? I say start with the most damaging petroleum there is. So in other words, shut down the tar sands in Alberta, which is the dirtiest, worst petroleum. And then the better petroleum, you keep them on for a while as you phase out. Mm -hmm. Let's say capitalism was based on quality instead of quantity. You know, we're trying to get everybody to consume more and more and more and more. Consume, discard, consume, discard. That can't go on forever. So what if everybody's into quality? So when you go to buy a blender, you, you save up until you can get one where you put an ice cube in and it doesn't blow out. Yeah. So in other words, owning fewer things but better things. Yep. And what if we had custom duties, let's say, on steel... And the steel that's made in really shitty steel mills around the world, China or whatever, you put a massive duty on them. And the steel that's made more responsibly, you have less duty or no duty. And, you know, it, I've been talking to people like John Kerry and Robert Reich and stuff about this idea of changing capitalism to where it's based on quality. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, that's wishful thinking. Well, you know what? After World War II, there was this guy, Deming, an American, who went to Japan and taught classes and convinced, at that time after World War II, Japan was on its way to becoming a China. They were making just shit stuff. Horrible. The cheapest possible stuff. And he went over there and convinced them to work on quality. And he changed the entire company around, I mean, the country around. Mm -hmm. So now when you buy something from Japan, it's of the highest quality. Whether it's food or, or you know, hard goods or whatever, it's, one man did that. Yeah. So I think it's possible to change capitalism to where it's not based on consuming, but based on owning less, but owning better. Mm -hmm. It makes it makes great sense, but you know you've you've spoken and written about um, this idea of growth being the enemy, growth being the sort of elephant in the moon, in the room. I think it's probably the human condition to some extent. But we in America or in the USA, there's so much about the bigger is better. I mean, with the supersize me kind of mentality. Um, and I, as a surfer, I mean, I've I, and and my life choices materialistic things of. They, I wish they meant more to me. They don't. Um, so I'm kind of left with more spiritual inner pursuits. But for the majority of people, you know, they go to the malls on the weekends and they buy stuff and that makes them happy. I know. That's, uh, I mean, fashion is a very powerful tool. In, like in Jackson Hole, where I spend the summers out there, and 
The hottest thing for the teenagers in Jackson is to wear their parents' old, old Patagonia stuff. Hmm. The older, the darker it is, the cooler it is. Uh-huh. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And now, compare that with buying a pair of brand new jeans with holes all over the goddamn thing. That's a fashion too, and that's a destructive fashion. Yeah. Horrible. We got to, you know, make fun of that. Mm-hmm. I love what you're saying, and I think the idea of, of quality being the most important thing, um, I, I, I agree with that, and I think I've found my way there in my life naturally. However, on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet for your average company, it's usually about units sold, it's about numbers, it's about seeing growth. And you talk about you know, the IPO thing. I, I, um, I was a competitive surfer through the 80s, and I was involved with a company that went public, and I watched the dynamic. I watched it go from a family business <laughs> to the, uh, you know, the shareholders want to see numbers increase every, every uh, quarter. I mean, even the, even the word quarter bothered me. I thought, well, I've never, what is a quarter yeah. at that time? But, I've, but now it's, no, this was going back. Now it's nothing new, but we definitely have seen, um, you know, there's that, there's that strange contradiction of a, of a company that's got its soul and then growth does become its enemy. And the bigger it gets, the less it can contain that. You know, your average lifespan of a corporation now is a little over 20 years. They grow like, you know, skyrocket, and then they die. Mm-hmm. And then you get thousands of people out of work and stuff. We just celebrated our 50th year because in 1989, when we got into some financial trouble and it was a recession and everything, we decided to do our planning as if we're going to be 100 years from now. Mm-hmm. And so even if you grow... 10% a year, in very few years, you're a trillion dollar company. So like, there's a group of companies um, that kind of a club. It's called the Hen- Henokin Club. And it's a group of companies that have been in business 200 years. So how do they maintain being in business for 200 years? One of two ways. One way is they just say no. There's a tea company that has been in business 750 years. <laughs> so, you know, they have a little tea shop. You can't mail order. You have to go there. They have the best Japanese teas there are. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And they've gone through, you know, 15 generations. They just say no. Another way is to di- diversify. You know, there are some companies in Europe that started out as a blacksmith shop like I did. And now they're making, I don't know, lipstick or something. You know, they've diversified. Yeah. But you can't go for very long doing the same thing. Because the elephant in the room is going to get you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm, I'm dealing with that right now. I mean, that's why I'm diversifying the company into foods and, mm-hmm. and uh, different things. You've learned a lot along the way, right? I mean, it's, it seems like you've sort of, there's a, there's a uh, for lack of a better expression, the DIY, the do-it-yourself. You, yeah. Your you, Patagonia's been a kind of DIY uh, process, yeah? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, breaking the rules is really fun. I mean, that's why I've, I've kept with it. I love breaking the paradigm and making it work and, and s- sort of sticking my nose out, you know, my th- whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's been successful because of that. I, I've given talks at, you know, commencements, universities. And the first thing I tell these kids, I said, look, life is a lot easier if you break the rules than trying to conform. Mm-hmm. Way easier. And probably a lot of you have been forced to study something that you have really no interest in doing. And in fact, you're going to get out of school and you're not going to work at what you studied. You know, maybe you studied anthropology. Well, good luck finding a job. I said, I saw a guy, Golden Gate Park recently. He's a dog walker. He's on his skateboard. He has 10 dogs (laughs) from little tiny Pekingese to German Shepherds, all on these Eskimo traces, Eskimo sled traces. And they're pulling like crazy. And they're having the time of their life. And he's just sitting there on a skateboard. Mr. Cool, 
making $25 a dog an hour. Wow. So $250 an hour, and you're going to end up staring at a goddamn computer all day long. Mm -hmm. Which one would you rather do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who were your heroes growing up before you, before you became a businessman? Um, my, my heroes were always explorers, and, mm -hmm. you know, Arctic explorers and Antarctic explorers and, you know, people like Burton and, you know, exploring Africa. They, it was always explorers. Mm hmm I read every adventure book I could on stuff like that. When you first started doing a lot of climbing and surfing when you were around, you know, Malibu, living in Bur the Burbank days, let's call it, um, w did you, I guess the, 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 the climbing tools kind of came out of necessity, right? You just, yeah. you were using stuff that wasn't, you knew you could make it better. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't help ourselves. I mean... When you know you can make something better, you do it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and there were first ascents back then. Yeah, almost all the climbs that we did were first ascents. I mean, why repeat somebody's route? Mm -hmm. When you're in Yosemite, you look around and all these walls had not been climbed, and you just say, hey, let's go do that one today. And, um, and that's far more meaningful than following someone else on a route. Mm -hmm. Or trying to do a speed record or, you know, like. Right. What was the thrill? And I say this, I have an idea because I have it, my version of it in the surf, but what, when you were, when you were young and coming to climbing and realizing this is something I really want to pour my life into, what was, what was the draw for you? What was the thrill? I was out to prove myself. I mean, that, that's what it was all about. It was an internal thing that, um, you know, I, I had, my old man was an alcoholic and, you know, we had screwed up family life in a lot of cases. And so I, I left early and, and I was just out to prove myself. You know, I was spearfishing when I was 16 to 18. And at that time we had to make all our own stuff. Mm -hmm. We had to make our own weight belts. We had to make everything. And there was no wetsuits. We, we wore wool and I, I was down in down in Malibu, getting my limited lobsters and abalone, and you know, those days are gone, but um, then I, I'm a, kind of a serial sportsman. I've done all of these different sports, and, and you know, I did whitewater kayaking all over the world, first descents. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love to get to an 80% stage of a sport and then i get bored mm -hmm. the last 20 percent you gotta you know like if you want to be a runner and uh the last 20 percent to world class is not worth doing for me and so i i jump from sport to sport and in fact like climbing i i focused on crack um, crack climbing for a while like you know a couple of years i just climbed cracks at Another couple of years, I climbed big walls. Another couple of years, I, I uh, did free climbing. And, you know, was, so I specialized for a while, and then I get bored, and I go off on a whole other tangent. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I became a complete climber. Like, I can go from point A to point B in the mountains and do it efficiently and safe, no matter what terrain it is. Mm -hmm. Do you still do a lot of it? No, I'm 84. I'm, I'm done for. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm still surfing, but uh, um, boards are getting longer and longer. Yeah. Tell me about surfing. Well, it, it's been a you know a really important part of my life. I've been surfing since the uh, mid 50s. Made my first surfboard out of balsa. I went down to General Veneer and bought some balsa and shaped my own board, glassed it, and um, then ended up, I first surfed it in Doheny, I think, and then Malibu, and then I ended up trading it for a Model A Ford engine <laughs> for my Model A. Then I bought a uh, Jacobs, and then I went from there to, you know, a lot of eggs, Greg Little's eggs, which screwed me up for thruster surfing because those eggs, you're riding your front foot 
and thrusters, you're riding your back foot. Right, yeah, yeah. And I never really made that transition very well, so mm -hmm. I, I prefer uh, the Cam one of those Campbell brother. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, the Bonzers. Yeah, I, I prefer yep. a Bonzer because yeah. it's kind of in between a thruster and sure. a single fin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you surfing Malibu during the Dora Gidget days? That oh, yeah, absolutely. And what was that like? Well... Dora was a real asshole. I mean, you know, he'd knock you off your board all the time. And, you know, he wasn't a likable person at all. But I never was part of that gang. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Munoz was there and Johnny Fain and all these guys. I had nothing to do. I would just go there and I would surf and I'd go home. Mm -hmm. I wasn't part of the surf culture, so-called. Mm -hmm. I've always been that way. Uh, Surf, do your stuff in the water, and then get out and not not hang out on the beach. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of that way too. When I was younger, I loved the beach scene, but now I it's just go do my thing and yeah. move on. How do you spend your days now? From May till November, I live in Jackson Hole, and I I'm crazed about fly fishing, and I'm applying a lot of the same philosophy of climbing and surfing and everything like that with fly fishing. I've got my flies down to practically one pattern in different sizes, all one color, and I make it work. It's kind of like Italian cooking, you know? Traditional Italian cooking uses no more than five ingredients, but each ingredient's got to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And if, if you limit yourself in any way, it forces you to be creative. And so I catch more fish than I've ever caught. Interesting. With one fly. Wow. And in fact, I'm writing another book about it right now. Um, and so I, I, I'm so deep into... <laughs> this book is about the, the, the center feather of a pheasant tail. Hmm. <laughs> So it's it's learning more and more about less and less. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 in, in, I get that. Um, it seems like simplicity and stripping down and instead of adding things, it's more about eliminating the superfluous things, I guess. Yeah. I mean, for me, when I see these guys on Elias and stuff, I mean, that is absolutely fantastic. When they're surfing better than a lot of the guys on regular boards, I think that's the way. That is, mm -hmm. and and I see guys soloing, you know, routes that I did on El Cap. Um, that took us ten days, and their guys are soloing it, and I say that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's the way to go. Mm -hmm. Has the climbing culture changed the way surf culture has changed? Yeah, it's now it's all rock climbing, rock climbing, rock climbing. It's uh, and it's and it's it's the danger part of it has been eliminated in a lot of rock climbing mm -hmm. you know the sport climbing sport climbing belongs in the sport pages you know and that's what was in the olympics and you know perfectly safe there's still you know the odd guy that goes out and sticks his neck out and and does alpine climbing in the himalayas and stuff like that but it's it's basically a gymnastic thing mm -hmm. And I would imagine that social media has infiltrated as well, where people get on up high and they do the selfie of themselves, and it's there's this sort of uh, share it all, share it with all your friends and get well, the glory. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get you get guys surfing down little beach break over here. That is, you know, about a thirty foot ride. So they ride boards with extreme rockers so they can get as many turns as possible and it's ugly to watch mm -hmm. they come over here at this point break and their boards just bogged down mm -hmm. can't get any speed and they have no idea what to do it's it's a so i look at that as sport climbing and this is more like mm -hmm. regular climbing. yeah you're listening to soundings with jamie brissick this podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. 
To learn more about the Surfers Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Now, back to our guest, Yvonne Chouinard. Two thousand eleven. Don't buy this jacket. Revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. It was an ad. And where was this ad? We put this ad in the uh, New York Times that, National Edition. Yes, that's what I thought. And I mean, we're dead serious about it. It wasn't. It was on Black Friday, so it wasn't to get more sales. It was a good time to announce that. Think twice before you want to buy this jacket. Are you just bored? Mm-hmm. Do you really need it? Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you do buy it, well, thank you. But what we're going to do is we're going to guarantee that jacket. So no matter what happens to it, we'll fix it. When it comes down to you're, you've gotten too fat for it or whatever, we'll find another person to sell it to you can, we'll buy it back from you. We'll sell it to somebody else. When it comes time to completely, the thing is completely shot. We're going to build this jacket so it can be recycled into more polymer or more jackets. And that forced us to build the largest garment repair facility in North America. Hmm. And same with our wetsuits. I mean, if you have a problem with your wetsuit, we... We fix thousands of wetsuits. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel like we own that product forever. Yeah. And of course, from that ad, we sold more of those jackets than we well, possibly. I know. I was going to say, but it's uh, but it was so. I think it was so radical. I mean, I the I, I almost think of it as like a a therapist who has a patient on the on the on the on the couch and they do their things and this therapist one day says you don't need my services anymore and it's sort of like okay you're so good i want to keep coming back to you it's um it's interesting that uh i think it was probably so revolutionary and went against what any other apparel manufacturer was doing that they that it there was a sort of street cred that that Patagonia attained through this, where it's like these these are the this is the coolest brand out there because they're actually doing exactly the opposite of uh, what yeah. everyone else is doing. Well, I I got a an award, like this is when social media was just being born, by the American Advertising Council. So I got this big award and I went back to New York. Normally I'd never accept those things, but this is such a big deal. I went back there and you know before. They gave me an award, they gave one to Nike. And the guy from Nike gets up and he shows a 15 minute film of all their sponsored athletes, their paid sponsored athletes. And then, uh, then he thanked his, you know, three advertising agencies and blah, blah, blah. So I get up and I say, well, you know, I'd like to thank my advertising agencies, but we don't have one. In fact, we don't advertise. I mean, this is the advertising council. I said, uh-huh. we spend one, tenth of one percent of sales on advertising i said but we do marketing but we don't have the marlboro man Mm -hmm. we just tell people who we are but that means you got to live according to who you say you are yeah and i said in any case social media is going to kill advertising (laughs) so i got a very muted (laughs) <laughs> clap uh-huh. response from that one <laughs> but it's true it's, yeah we just tell people who we are yeah yeah no i mean i think that is um that's that that's the great appeal is there and and it's it's rare in the in that milieu i think there's a lot of um smoke and mirrors out there you know oh yeah what about um the one percent for the planet uh which was 1985 the the self-imposed earth tax how did that come about we, we used to give 10% of our sales before taxes to the environment. And then I saw a lot of other companies saying something similar. And it's very easy to, at the end of the year, give yourself a big bonus. And then you have, you know, small profits. And then you can give 10% of that. So they were cheating. So I said, you know, it shouldn't be charity. It should be a cost of doing business. I mean, we're all polluters. Mm-hmm. And so why not 1% of sales? And that's where that started. And uh, it now has 
500 members hmm. and 65, 65 countries and more than 50% are overseas now. Wow. Great work. So it's, yeah, I mean, Surfer's Journals signed up early on and I was really stoked about that. And, you know, in reality, it, I don't see why every company doesn't do it. Raise your prices mm -hmm. four tenths of one percent yeah. because you're going to pay forty percent taxes or something, or so, and you can write all your all this off. Mm -hmm. Raise your prices. Say you're an attorney, you're charging five hundred dollars an hour. Charge five hundred and ten dollars an hour. Yep. Who's not going to use your services because you raised your prices ten ten dollars or something? Mm -hmm. And then you can give away all this money and feel good about it. Yeah, yep. I can't believe that we don't have more companies doing it. Yeah. Imagine if, if you, a gas, you know, you, you got a gas station on a corner and there's four gas stations there. And one of them, you go get gas and on your little receipt says, thank you for your service. Uh, you know, 1% of your total is going to go to yeah. making a new, a new park somewhere. Which gas station would you go yeah, to? Of course. Gas is yep. gas. Yep. Yep. They're all the same price. Mm -hmm. They're all fixed. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's just good business. Yep. Any great climbing stories? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I've got a lot of... Have you ever been in injured? Oh, yeah. I've broken ribs a few times. I've been in avalanches. I've been in three avalanches. I've yeah, I mean, climbing is dangerous, you know. It really is. I mean, mm -hmm. well, so is foiling. I mean, Jesus. Oh, yeah, foiling. I tried foiling, and I thought I was going to split open skin. Yeah, you're riding this goddamn plow. Oh, man. And it's sharp. <laughs> and, and, it, and, 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 you're, sharp. and you're falling from, you know, five, four uh, feet up, or whatever it is, and you land hard on that thing. Yeah. yeah. It's really you scary. Know, I've, I've had accidents every which way. I've, I've split my scalp you know, riding razors at the ranch and, um, blood, you know, scalp wounds bleed like crazy. Mm -hmm. Blood is just pouring down my face. My son paddles over, he sees all that blood and he's thinking, oh my God, and then he paddles away because he's afraid of sharks. Uh -huh. <laughs> <A> good son. <laughs> I mean, I've had a lot of close calls and every, I mean, I've lost a friend spearfishing when I was with him. Wow. He got tangled up in the kelp and had to go tell his parents he died. Jeez. Um, I used to do a lot of expeditions with British climbers. I preferred going with the British because they keep a stiff upper lip all the time and had a lot of good friends and they're all dead. Mm. I mean, they, a whole generation of them went from the Alps to the Himalayas and they died. Wow. But I, you know, I don't think about that. I, what about Zen? Did you, have, you, you mentioned Zen more than once in your book. Do you, did you study Zen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a philosophy, I think it's pretty cool. The, the idea of going towards more and more simple rather than more and more complex. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you can approach Zen with contemplation, sitting there staring at your navel and or you can do it through action yeah and i've done it through action i think you live for those times you know it's kind of like you walk up to a pool table one day and all of a sudden you run the whole table you think jesus and then the next game you can't sink a shot sure so what happened there? yeah 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 and if you could work towards controlling that yeah that's what zen is yeah 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 no, it's a really interesting one, and I think um, I learned this when I was a competitive surfer. I I wanted it so badly, and I and I was trying so hard, and I feel yeah. like I was gripping it too tightly. And then when I stepped away from pro surfing, but I'd spent a lot of my years really working hard look, at the ground. Look at me now. I did the best surfing of my life. <laughs> as soon as I sort of abandoned the, the, the contest jersey, yeah. I, I, uh, I relaxed. And I, I always feel like there's a great lesson that I try to apply to pretty much every facet of my life, which is don't try too hard. Try hard enough, point, point in the right direction, but also step back and allow things to just be what they're going to be. Yeah. 
But I, you're uh, thinking about the the, the in, you know the entire trajectory and odyssey of Patagonia. It seems like there's been a certain level of that with with you. Yeah, because we never focus on the end result at all, and uh, we focus on things that matter to us, our values, and in the end. It's karma. It's just good business. Mm -hmm. It really comes back. I really believe in karma. Um, if these companies that are focused on the bottom line, they're so focused on it that they do everything wrong. And they don't last very long. And, and you know, the, I mean, this Friedman philosophy of business is where you maximize profits for the shareholders. And you just make those profits any way you can, and you're ruthless. And, and then it's up to you to do what you want with your profits. Mm -hmm. We think that it should, the responsibility is making everyday decisions. And that's been the secret of our success, really. Mm -hmm. It's just that we include that responsibility and that philanthropy or cost of doing business or whatever you want to call it in in our everyday life at work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's a different capitalism has to change because it's sort of you know I mean, I mean you look at this country I've been reading books about end of empires every empire through history lasts on the average of 200 or 250 years hmm. We're there. Mm -hmm. And of all the criteria for empire collapse, we check off every single one. Mm -hmm. Like this country can't be governed. It's two different countries. It can't be governed. And look at the Soviet Union trying to hold together all of these diverse cultures and countries. They couldn't do it. Yeah, We can't do it either. I mean... California has nothing in common with Alabama. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I think we're sitting here bearing witness mm -hmm. to the end of the empire. Mm -hmm. It's going to fall apart. Yeah. And it's the Constitution is totally obsolete. You know, it's 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 a couple hundred years old, and it makes no sense in this day and age. Yeah. And it can't be changed. So there we are. Yep. Yep. What's been most important for you in your life? Well, I think, you know, my family, I guess. I mean, it sounds corny, but I'm a happy man. I, I uh, there's nothing I want or need or anything. And uh, I've got great kids. I got great grandkids. And, uh, I'm healthy. Uh, I mean, I just got a spine operation to get rid of some bone growth on my spine, and that came from a surfing accident at Pavonis about 50 years ago. Hmm. I landed on my butt on a round rock, and, and I had, you know, horrible spasms, and I think it forced bone growth against my spine. Uh -huh. So I just got that operation a couple months ago, and. I'm cleared to go surfing and play tennis again, and so I'll be out there in a day or two as soon as the Thanksgiving swell comes up. Yes. It always a, does. There, it's, it's so true. <laughs> I can remember that from my childhood. It always made it tough to, to get home in time for the turkey. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, do you have more surf trips planned? No. I, I can't handle uh, going to the South Pacific. Those hollowways. I have... I have a, uh, you know, eat. yeah, getting up is getting harder and harder. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could surf waves like Malibu all day long because you got all the time in the world to get up. It has a bottom. A lot of places like in the, you go to Tahiti or those places, shit, there's no bottom to those waves. Yeah. It's free fall takeoffs. Yeah, I know. A longboard doesn't fit in the waves. Absolutely. And so uh, I can't ride a shortboard anymore. Yeah. So, no, I don't travel anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you, with traveling, um, did, it, did you ever feel like you were being sort of open up to these other cultures that made you 
question the U.S. value system? Oh, absolutely. I've never considered myself as a patriotic American. Yeah, I relate to that. I'm, I'm a creature of the world. Yeah. I could live a lot of different countries. Yeah. Um, and live very well and happy. And I'm not wedded to we're number one and, you know, running around with my finger in the air. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're quality of life. The U.S. is number 17th in the world. Mm -hmm. We're just behind Croatia for quality of life. Wow. I mean, I mean, it's, we're just in La La Land, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Why do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's greed? Do you think it's, it's insecurity? Yeah. I mean, the number one thing for everybody is personal security. Everybody's making decisions in their lives based on personal security. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't understand it myself. I mean, first of all, I love change. People look at change as a threat. I think it change is a great opportunity. And so if, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't understand it myself, but that's what's driving America is yeah. security. Yeah, I've never seen, I've never seen our, our country so polarized. Is it, it, when I was, and it, I might've been not more naive when I was younger, but I just, you know, we could, um, both political parties could be at the dinner table together and it would be fine. Whereas now it, it just seems like that doesn't happen. Yeah, I was in, you know, I was a kid in World War II. Living in Maine, there was no sugar. There was no meat. We ate horse meat because we're French Canadians, you know. <laughs> we got horse meat. But everybody had a garden. The whole country rallied together for World War II and now trying to rally just this country to f defeat global warming, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And we not only have to all get together in this country to do that, we have to get China and Russia, all the other countries, all working together. Otherwise, we don't have a chance of yeah. getting a handle on this. You know, humans are the only species that won't work together. You get slime moles that work together. You get trees that help each other out. You get bacteria. We're the only creature that won't work together for the common good. You know, Ramon Navarro, you know, the surfer from sure. Chile. Yep. His father was a hard hat diver. And he told me stories about abalone. Well, you think, well, abalone is a snail. You know, it moves really slowly. It eats, you know, algae off on the rocks and stuff. He said, in Chile, because they have big waves, a lot of times the rock reef gets covered with sand. So what do the abalone do? They come together, they make a ball, and the wave rolls them onto the next reef. Oh, incredible. So smart. What would humans do? Every man for himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean... There's, there's an animal with a tiny little brain that we think, you know, the lights are not on there. They are, mm -hmm. way more than we are. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, I, I felt this when I started traveling in my late teens and spending time in other countries. I was able to see our country from a distance and, and, and be more critical of it in a way. Yeah. And I thought the whole kind of American dream, this, this notion of self-invention and, and reinvention, the new world, and... and, and you know, we champion so much people, you know, going for real lofty goals. Um, whereas in other countries, in Australia, for instance, there's the tall poppy syndrome where they chop you down for being overly ambitious. But I sometimes think, uh, you know, and, and I, I can see both sides of it, of course, but I sometimes think that our, our kind of ruthless ambition is, is at, the, uh, at the heart of a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right in that. I think it's the old manifest destiny or we came over from Europe and it was ours to grab what we could and defend it against everybody else. Yep. Fence it off. Yep. You know, like Americans, well now they, they can't do that, but Americans 10 years ago would go to New Zealand, they'd buy a big ranch and they'd put a fence around it and no trespassing signs. Well, that is a no-no in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. In New Zealand, you can walk on anybody's property and access the rivers and everything. And then here are the Americans, First thing they do is they put a fence around it. Yeah, that's 
I think that's the manifest destiny thing. Yeah. That's the old West where you defend it with your Winchester, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, for, to the extent that the, the hell in a handbag way in which the world is going, there's also, I do feel like there's a more, there's more honesty. People's kind of bullshit detectors are stronger than I've ever seen them in my lifetime. And I just, if I watch episodic television, the level of, good writing and honesty and kind of getting to the heart of things it's really advanced I, that wasn't there 20 years ago huh. yeah or if you look at advertising maybe talking about the Marlboro Man the Marlboro Man would be more of a Saturday Night Live parody than it would be a, a yeah. genuine thing yeah, that people right. would buy into you know yeah, yeah that's right no, but I think, um, and, I, and, it, and it's an overused word, and it's probably a, a word thrown around in marketing meetings, but uh, authenticity um, is, it really, it does, it does count for a lot. And I think when you do, when you make your life choices as close to what you would be doing if you were, a, you know, had inherited millions of dollars or what have you, when you, when you, when you kind of follow what you love and, and trying to make sure that... Um, an income can align with it as close as possible to what I would be doing if left to my own devices. Oh, I think that's the definition of happiness is that you're working at what you love. Yeah. No matter what it is. Yep. And, you know, a lot of people are forced to do jobs that they hate. So many people get a degree and something and then they don't work at it. And, um, it's really hard to find a job that you really love to do, I think. I agree. And not only a job, but the thing that I think about in, in speaking, of, you know, surfer and a climber, surfers, we are very fortunate in that we found something we love. I mean, I, 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 let me rephrase this. There are a lot of people who don't know what they love. You know, they've never really found that thing. Yeah. And I think we're sitting here today, you as a climber and a surfer, myself as a surfer, where we found at a very young age, naturally with no one guiding us, just something that was really close to our hearts and that we wanted to devote our lives to. Yeah, I could be talking to you about spearfishing the whole time. Yeah. I mean, that I was so into that. And not scuba. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anything to do with scuba. I wanted to learn to control my breath so I could go down for three minutes. Wow. And spear something. And not cheat by using a scuba yeah. tank. Yep. I mean, we could talk about any one of these sports forever. And yeah. It, yep. They're all connected. I mean. Yeah. But what um, I what, what's his name uh, did that book on surfing and climbing in the fifties? Uh, oh yeah, Tom Adler. Tom T Adler. T Adler books. That's a beautiful book. He compared yeah the first guys to surf Waimea to the first guys climbing El Cap. Yeah. We when we first climbed El Cap, there were no rescue groups. The Rangers were not climbers. We took off on these overhanging walls with no chance of rescue. But wow. You could easily hand over the hardware to somebody and they'd drop it. You, you'd die up there. Jeez. Like Prometheus. Jeez. You know, the birds would come and peck at your liver. Wow. And that was it. And the first guys to surf YMA, they didn't know if they could be held down until they died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. Yeah. This is very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Self-reliance, it seems like it's been a big theme throughout your life. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, you know what? I used to go to Mexico in uh, 1958. That's where I met a bunch of guys from Huntington Beach who had the first skateboard. And uh, living out of my car. And uh, I'd get sick. Because, you know, in those days, everybody got really sick. I never took any antibiotics or flagell or anything, I would take a glass of warm water, pour a bunch of salt in it and ashes from the fire mm -hmm. and drink that. And I just puke it out and clean myself out completely. So I've been doing that all my life. I, fi I drink out of every river I fish in, mm -hmm. except when there's dying salmon and stuff. But mm -hmm. I've been with people who see me do that and they take a drink and they come down with Giardia. Wow. And I, I have maybe a stomach upset for a day or two. So I, I've, been, I've been kind of preparing myself for when, you know, we have to live in an Ethiopian refugee camp mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where, you know, nine out of ten Americans are going to die. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, it's a little game I play with myself. Mm -hmm. But I, I've been pushing myself physically and mentally all my life. Mm -hmm. And it's a little game I play. Yeah. And it's very satisfying. Yeah. Got any secrets to pass along? Secrets? Yeah. Things that you've learned that uh, are valuable? Like I said, you know, breaking the rules is really fun. Yeah. It's creative. It's just uh, because society is doing everything wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been cooking some pastas now with two ingredients. Olive oil doesn't count. But, <laughs> but two ingredients. I mean, I have a onion pasta that's just onions. Wow. It's unbelievable. Huh. It's so good. It's incredible. More and more simplicity. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do with my life right now is, uh, you know, I, I, I read a book, I give a book. Mm -hmm. I don't keep books in a bookshelf and I'm divesting a lot of stuff I don't need. Mm -hmm. I think that's the general direction to go. Yeah. It's really satisfying. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting talking about pessimism earlier. The, there, there, there are ways of being pessimistic or slash realistic, um, yeah. but also, but also uh, feeling that way, but not, not with a hardened place, in a hardened yeah. place, but with a levity and a sense of, um, you know, you still have a sense of humor and you sort of like, it's almost gallows humor. You know, it's sort of like, we're, it's <laughs> all right. going to hell, but it, we're, we're going to have a good time as we go out kind of thing. Yeah, I've, I've been in, you know, life and death, in fact, I, one avalanche, I basically went over the, the, the edge, went over to the other side. And I realized there's nothing to fear there. And so um, I'm not gripped that I'm going to die one day at all. It's just it, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's a beginning and end to everything. My company is not going to be here 100 years from now, but we're going to try to be there. And I'm going to try to be as healthy as I can and live as long as I can. But I'm, somebody tells me I got incurable cancer, I'm going to say, okay, forget the chemo and I'll just, that's it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a happy person, mm -hmm. even though I'm very pessimistic about the fate of the planet. And I love this planet, you know. My daughter wants to do a t-shirt that says, fuck Mars, save our home planet. <laughs> yeah. That's what we should be saying. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm bummed about that. And there's a lot of great creatures we're taking with us. And, and you know, these poor people on these migrations, it's going to get so much worse. And I really feel sorry for them. And, but... Um, I do what I can, and that's it. Yep. What would you advise people to do on a, on a totally personal level? I mean, each of us. Well, when we changed our mission statement in the company, I got 2,500 employees. I said to every employee, what does this mean to you and your job? Because I can't do it all myself. So what does that mean? That means the surf team is not hiring the Kelly Slaters and the professional surfers that are on top, they're hiring uh, surfers that are committed to saving the planet and going out and influencing young people and stuff like that. We're not interested in having ambassadors at, a, at the top of their game. And then it's changed everybody's job. It really has. Mm -hmm. They're making decisions um, with different criteria. Yeah. I really like the idea of the quality being the, the priority. I think about that a lot. And I've, I've come to it just naturally through my life. Yeah. Having fewer things, but things that last, things that endure, things that are timeless. Yeah. You know, it's like in the 70s. I mean, some of these guys were going around the world with one surfboard. Now, you know, the pros, they got 10 surfboards because they're going to break eight of them because yeah. they're, they're glass so shoddily and light. What's with that? I mean, that's it makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. 
you can have one surfboard and you can I have a nine foot kind of a Hawaiian style longboard. I can ride the biggest waves at razors or I can ride two foot waves with it. Yeah. I like that simplicity and minimalism. I'm similar. I yeah. keep a board in my car that is kind of an all rounder as well. Yeah. Yeah, make it work. I mean, it forces you to push and make it work. Yep. Thank you, and it's so great to meet you. I've been, I've admired you for many, many years. Well, I've admired your writing, let me tell you. Thanks. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is written and performed by Poslin Chantin and Gita Valtistodor. It is produced by Poslin Chantin and engineered by Samur Kuja. Soundings is brought to you by the Surface Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surface Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfacejournal.com and subscribe. Thanks for listening to Soundings. We'll see you next time.